I'm here to talk a little bit about the uh, banding operation that takes place at uh, Manomec in uh, southeastern Massachusetts. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't, first off, uh, credit all the people in the past who have actually helped uh, collect the data that uh, I'll be presenting here. A lot of those people also brought those data together uh, to formulate all of the things that I'll be telling you about. Um, there are many people, uh, including at this meeting, who have helped us collect these data and have worked at the internet, uh, including Lauren, who, or yeah, Lauren as yep. well. So pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, I see a couple other faces in there as well. Fan of birth at Manomet, which is pretty awesome. Um, all right, so what is Manomet? Uh, I should also say, Woodward. Um, I, I should say that Manomet as a whole, I'm not the director of Manomet in general because that would be a nightmare because Manomet does a whole lot of stuff. Uh, we're a little bit different from uh, some of the other organizations that are that are presenting here in that we've got uh, a very much a hemispheric approach. Um, so we work all throughout the Western Hemisphere, and that's because a lot of the things that uh, scientists at Manham and study uh, utilize the entire hemisphere throughout their annual cycle. Uh, so we've got research going on in the North Slope of Alaska, also on Cook's Island up here. Um, working on extremely long distance migrant shorebirds that spend their off season, if we call it that, which if you're a shorebird, you don't get them off season. Um, but they essentially migrate all the way down, sometimes uh, down to uh, southern Brazil. Uh, and in some cases, in the case of things like red knots, uh, they might go as far south as the southern tip of Argentina before turning around and going back up to their tundra breeding grounds. Um, but historically, uh, we've actually started out uh, as a small bird observatory here in uh, southeastern Massachusetts. Um, if you're interested in the other work that Manomet does, which also includes working for sustainability uh, fisheries and forestry uh, in the Gulf of Maine area, uh, check out our website, manomet.org. All right, done the plug. We did it. <laughs> okay, so. Where I work uh, is a long history of research, uh, and uh, this is our lovely banding lab, so we're very fortunate that we've actually got a roof over where we process the birds that we capture. Um, many people, it's just, just a picnic table out in the woods, so uh, very lucky to have that, and we've been so fortunate, and so uh, we've been able to recognize it so much that we haven't really changed much inside at all. Uh, bird biologists, we like to talk about changes in the bird population, but we hate change. We don't like change. Um, so the only thing we've really changed over the years is how we enter our data, which uh, is with this data program here. But uh, this photo was only taken a few years ago, and we're still using a floppy disk. Um, and this is a program that is from 1989. So uh, we're actually working on, uh, in this spring we'll be testing on a new uh, cloud-based System, so it's a little bit more secure, although how insecure is a floppy disk. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so lots of history. Some of you may even recognize the basis here. We won't get into it because that was a long time ago. Uh, but we also have a long history of education. Um, so this is a photo from the 70s of so some kids checking out a bird here. Uh, I can tell us it's the 70s because nowadays uh, I would never allow a child to hold a bird like that. Um, but more recently, we're also showing the joy of birds in the hand. So really connecting people to nature is one of the things we really are very much into. Uh, we also love sharing the lessons that we've learned with the public. Um, it's really important, it's exciting to see a conference like this happening um, because so many uh, researchers kind of just toil along and uh, collect their data and for the longest time hoarding it. Uh, which if you're studying animals that migrate thousands and thousands of miles a year, and these animals are being studied all along their journey by different people, it makes a ton of sense to be sharing the information, and we're literally studying the same exact bird. Um, so sharing our information not only with uh, collaborators and researchers, but also with the public, super important. Um, also here, you can see that she's super obsessed with this bird. <laughs> it's also said that many people have met a man at Manomac. That is true. We've been around a long time. There have been uh, several marriages through all of that. 
<laughs> won't get into that. But, um, all right. So where are we? We are here. Uh, this is our lovely arm of Cape Cod. Uh, Mammoth kind of sticks out. It's a tiny little point called Mammoth Point. Great for sea watching, particularly in the fall, watching uh, scoters migrate by. Uh, really great duck migration spot. Um, so we've been monitoring uh, scoters off and on there for a long time. Obviously doing the songbird banding on site, uh, but we also do a lot of uh, work looking at habitat management and ecological impacts of that. So we've spent a lot of time working in Miles Standish State Forest, which is a large tract of um, southeastern Massachusetts pine barrens around. The globally rare ecosystem is the, the population hotspot for uh, prairie warblers. Um, you're also talking about the declines of um, eastern tokies. It's a huge hotspot for them, as well as uh, the common yellow throats that we learned about uh, here that are flying pretty, pretty massively. So, pretty important spot there. We're working with the state. They actually use fire to, um, to uh, manage the habitat. So we're looking at how the fire is actually influencing population densities in these birds. Um, also, since we've been doing the same thing for a long time, and we have so many uh, seasonal staff come through, we've had thousands and thousands of seasonal staff uh, come through our banding lab, learn uh, safe and uh, sound uh, uh, bird research techniques. Uh, they work very closely with bird scientists, um, and we basically sent them on to, to do other things. So that's probably our biggest impact, really, is, is this web of uh, man missions that have gone, that are covering the earth now. Um, and then I mentioned our education and outreach work that we do as well. Um, this is our property here, and this is Mammoth Point proper. Um, our property, this is our building here. This is a recent photo too, because we've got solar panels, which are so cool. Um, but uh, this is our property here. Uh, it's basically comprised of two parts. Uh, there's a coastal forest that even has a bluff here. And then we've got sort of a, a more recent acquisition of land here, which encompasses an old cranberry bog operation. Uh, we're currently in the process of um, managing the water levels here, as well as these two bogs up here. This bog just the other day had uh, over 40 uh, down ducks hanging out in it, which is very exciting. And we just completed a boardwalk and blind here out in, in this bog, uh, which is going to be sort of our showcase for, for how you can sort of restore these bog habitats, which is very exciting. Uh, our nets that we use to capture birds, uh, they are located all around these forested areas and uh, they operate throughout the year. So I'll show you this net in a second. Um, but our migration band has been going consistently spring and fall since 1969. Uh, the first bird was banded on the property in 1966, but Manomet was incorporated in 1969. And that's when we really began a uh, more regimented spring and fall routine. So unlike a, a lot of the studies that you might hear about um, uh, today or that you may have heard about uh, previously today, um, we're really looking at a migratory cohort. Uh, so we're using the numbers of birds that we capture and the timing and whatnot as kind of a proxy for the bird population, but we're not looking at where those birds are nesting. We're not looking at signs of nesting success. We're primarily looking at the numbers of birds we capture. Uh, we can do this because we've been doing the same thing consistently for over five decades. Um, so in doing so, we can control for uh, how many nets we have open, we know when our nets are open, um, and we can control for the uh, numbers of birds we catch. So it works out pretty nicely. Uh, not sure we really had any idea when we first started that we really wanted to be doing things super consistently, but it's extremely fortunate that we did, um, that we've really stuck to our guns. We've kept our nets in the same places as well. Um, so it's pretty good, pretty good sampling of, of uh, data. Um, along those lines, uh, we're catching, uh, well, we just caught our quarter of a million bird a few years ago. It was um, our most uh, common species here. Uh, for some reason, it's half of its name got cut off, but do we recognize this? <laughs> It's a gray catbird. Yeah, this is easily uh, comprises over 40% of the birds that we've caught. So, um, 
Yeah, particularly in the fall. Um, so Ray Capper is basically our, our mascot. Um, our nets, the way that they're set up, we really only catch uh, what we consider songbirds. Uh, so those are uh, passerines and near passerines. So those are things like uh, catbirds, warblers, sparrows, thrushes, um, occasionally uh, small hawks, uh, woodpeckers, that kind of thing. Uh, but not waterfowl and shorebirds and swans. That would be my <laughs> uh, So these are <coughs> Not the greatest photos, but uh, this is what a mist net kind of looks like up close. Imagine essentially a seven foot tall, uh, 30 foot long hair net uh, strung through the woods. Uh, they've got these strings that run the whole length of them. They're kind of separated into four different panels. It creates these pockets. So uh, birds are really good at picking up very fine movement. I mean, if you've ever watched a, a, a bird uh, pick little caterpillars off of the end of a branch. It's amazing that they're able to even find these things, or even more incredible is watching, uh, like around here I imagine there are bluebirds that hang out in fields. Um, just watching a bluebird, particularly in the winter or the fall, sit on a, on a branch and then fly down 20 feet, pick up a, a big grub from the ground and fly back to a perch. Just the ability to pick up those fine movements is really great for uh, catching things, but unfortunately for birds, uh, fortunately for us, uh, things that are this thin and ideally not moving are not something that really compute in a bird's mind. So as they're flying through the woods, they fly into these nets, uh, and they are able to be extracted pretty quickly uh, because we run around at half hour or so to the birds out. Um, so this is a generic red star having some netting pulled out from its feet usually the last things that sort of come out. Um, and uh, those birds then get put in a little cloth bag, which is fun. Uh, I used to have to explain that you could breathe through a cloth bag, um, but then we spent like four years wearing these. So <laughs> you don't have to explain that anymore. It's fine. Um, we bring the birds back to the lab, and then we put a tiny little metal band. Uh, for us, we put it on the right leg of the bird. And it's effectively like a little anklet, uh, but it gives them each of them a nine-digit social security number. So believe it or not, these sizes are going to go on a black hole warbler. Uh, this tiny little band has nine digits on it. Also, if you open it up on the inside, it has some contact information for the federal banking office. Um, but I don't know if anyone has actually ever done that once they find the bird. Um, but yeah, we get these bands from the federal government. Small banding office based out of Maryland uh, that ships out millions of bands to people like us. Uh, we then put those bands on birds and then report what birds we've banded. Um, they're also the people that get contacted uh, when a bird like this ends up being found somewhere else. Um, so you might hear about some other cool technologies that are going on. I know MODIS has been talked about and all of that. And those are very much cutting edge. This is as analog as it gets. This is um, uh, the floppy disk to their uh, <coughs> notice me, sip disk. I don't know. Anyways, um, so this is very much reliant upon somebody finding this bird again. Um, but yeah, we put the bands on birds. This is oh, this is what a band on a bird looks like. Uh, there's been a lot of research that's gone into determining whether. Um, these bands negatively impact bird survival. Uh, for the songbirds that we have here, and I'm sorry, this is not a purple finch. This is a house finch. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's hard to get a picture of a bird with a band. Um, birds don't often show their legs, at least songbirds. So, uh, anywho, uh, this is a house finch uh, that is nested underneath the eaves of our buildings at Manamet for probably a like, decade now. Um, and it's a great example of how uh, a band will basically just weather and just hang out on a bird's legs for a long time. Uh, very rarely do we have to replace bands. Usually what we do is on birds that spend a lot of time in really uh, corrosive habitats. Um, most recently we replaced the band on a grackle. Uh, the band was over 10 years old, which is pretty awesome. Uh, but it was super, super thin. Uh, the other would be woodpeckers, because they're all shifting on trees. 
So they're basically sanding their van down. <laughs> so resident birds, obviously. Sorry, what? Those are resident birds that stick around. So how do you recapture them? Oh, well, yeah, so our recaptures on site are typically, yeah, they're typically birds that are gonna either be resident birds or migratory birds that actually breed on the property here. <coughs> I'll talk, well, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about, in a minute, about some of the patterns and age classes of birds that we catch that might point to the reason why we don't catch so many migrating birds multiple years in a row. Um, but, yeah, so this is a bird that's a, a resident bird. Oh, this time of year on the property, I don't know where they go, the house finches, they leave our property and they go to the neighborhood somewhere. Um, and it's an aside. <coughs> so, that person's right in here, in the room right here. But yeah, we basically collect a handful of information. You can't really read it on this thing. Um, but not only do we put a band on, we've done a lot of effort to catch that bird in the first place. Um, so we take a handful of other more metric measurements. So we'll measure their wing, um, oftentimes uh, tail as well. If they're species specific things, we'll sometimes measure bill. Um, we look at different qualities of feathers to determine the age of the bird. Oftentimes we can tell if a bird is either um, effectively a bird in its first year or a bird older than that. Uh, most of the birds we get replace all their feathers after their first year. Uh, so after that, it's kind of anyone's guess as to how old they are, unless you're living on. Um, and uh, yeah, we weigh the birds as well, and then we release them. Um, and so it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's something that uh, a lot of banding stations out there do. Unfortunately, there are lots of banding stations to capture our birds as well. Um, so where do our birds go? This is sort of the most basic question of all. It's kind of the reason why people started banding birds in the first place. Um, and it's one of the more simple questions to answer, but it has its limitations. So what kind of, so okay, on this map here, these are all the birds that uh, we've captured and banded that were found in the red dot. And all the yellow dots, before you ask, are birds that were banded in that yellow dot place that we then captured at Panama up here. Um, this is excluding birds uh, from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island because it would just be a giant blob. Um, but do you see any patterns to where our birds go or where they come from? Sort of obvious ones. Yeah. East Coast of Iowa. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, okay, that's perfect. So, you mentioned East Coast, but you also mentioned something called a flyway. Has everyone here heard the term flyway before? Yeah. So flyway is effectively just like a migratory, a generalized migratory highway. Um, flyways, so migratory paths taken by individual species vary quite a bit, um, but they do tend to stick to certain patterns. So flyways are a very important conservation tool in some ways because uh, by looking at conservation goals within a flyway, you might be helping out not just your target species, but you might be helping out a handful of species and sometimes more. Um, but yeah, so initial banding efforts basically gave us this idea of these migratory pathways. So generally our birds stick to the East Coast, uh, what we would call the Atlantic flyway or the Eastern flyway. Um, we have some pretty fun little outliers around here. Um, you know, very cool things like uh, this is a black-billed cuckoo down here. No idea how someone found it down there. Um, this is a chickadee, which we don't <laughs> often think of as uh, being migratory. Um, but they do have sort of post-breeding dispersal um, that oftentimes moves along the coast. Uh, but I guess this bird just sort of wandered off. This over here is a pine siskin, which is another species that has, uh, and they're sort of those eruptive finch species out there. Um, and my favorite, honestly, is this one here, which is a bird that was banded initially in Homestead, Florida, which is the gateway to the Everglades. And uh, this bird is an American goldfinch that made it back up to Massachusetts. It was banded in the winter and made it up to Massachusetts time for spring next year, which is really interesting. We don't often think of our backyard birds uh, as really moving these huge distances, but in some cases they can. Uh, these are American robins, so uh, pretty cool. 
Um, but I will say there are only a few hundred dots on this map and we've banded over 250,000 birds. Uh, so the return on investment, extremely low for just putting a, metal, a piece of metal on a small animal and letting it go and hoping somebody finds it. <laughs> this shouldn't surprise anybody. Definitely uh, makes sense. Um, but that's why it's really important that we kept doing what we're doing in a very consistent way, because that way, the data that we get every single year can then be pooled together and used to look at trends in birds as well. Um, so, I'm going to show you guys this, which should be no surprise because we've seen things like this uh, all morning, uh, and you've probably seen this before. But effectively, uh, if we look at, and this is standardized for effort, so how often our nets are open and how many birds we're catching when our nets are open. Um, if we look at our numbers for spring and our numbers for fall, um, birds in general are about half as numerous as they were when we were going back in the 70s. And to Pam's point, like the, the baseline, this is our baseline, but if we went further back, I'm sure, baseline was much higher too. Um, but uh, these initial drop-offs are things that we can try to attribute to things. Uh, we can think about habitat loss, we can think about pesticide use and lack of available insect food. Um, but you know, it tends to be fairly uh, doom and gloom if you think about it on a, on a just overall bird uh, scale. Uh, and just to the, the point, these are all these different things. We actually published our own thing uh, around the same time as the three billion birds thing came out. We, we analyzed a whole bunch of trends uh, in the birds that we capture on site. So one of those birds we capture with pretty decent frequency is this lovely bird, the American Red Star. Um, and we saw its range map in the last talk. Um, but effectively, it's a bird that uh, is what we would call a neotropical migrant. So, a bird that spends its uh, off season or winter time, if you will, uh, in the uh, neotropics. Um, but as we saw, it really only spends uh, maybe two, maybe three months, if that, in this orange breeding range. And the rest of the time, it's basically migrating from point A to point B. Um, American red starts also hold territories on the wintering grounds, so you can kind of imagine that it's super important, like basically any spot along the way and where they're spending their winter, uh, it's really uh, critical for preservation of, of those sites. Um, and so the removal of any habitat in the wintering range or the breeding range, and possibly in between, um, can have pretty negative effects on that bird. You can see these are some of the results of uh, the numbers that we capture in the lab. We can look at spring, pretty incredible decline, and same thing with fall. Uh, oh, I should have mentioned as well, I can go back. Doing it, going back. <laughs> so, I should point out the fact that our sample size here is around uh, 86,000, and our sample size is about double in the fall. Why are there more birds in the fall? Because there's young babies, right? There are babies around, right? Okay, that's an important thing to, to consider. Okay. And that's why all those fall warblers are super confusing, because a lot of them are babies. But the people who complain about confusing fall warblers are babies, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. They're, they're all right. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, so. Red scarf, neotropical migrant, it's a species that's going to be encountering issues all throughout its life cycle. Um, and uh, it, not only that, compounding the fact that it is probably losing massive amounts of habitat for the species, uh, it, amongst the warblers, it's also perhaps the most aerial, aerially insectivorous of them all. When we talk about aerial insectivores, we're talking about things that catch flying bugs. If, that, if you were one. Um, so, these guys actually, for a warbler, have a very broad bill. And they've also got these funny little whiskers out here. They're called uh, rictal bristles. Uh, and those basically act as a flavor saver. So, if they're like out grabbing a bug or something, it might get stuck on their whisker and then they can snap it up. So, it increases surface area. Um, but yeah, so these guys, not only are they encountering uh, problems with habitat loss, compounded by the fact that they keep territories over the winter, 
uh, but they also eat aerial insects or flying insects, um, which are uh, rapidly declining as well. So kind of not going super great for the American red star. Now, it's not all due to the moon. Some of the species, which maybe are not super surprising, are things like the northern cardinal. Uh, our first band director uh, went out and saw the first, uh, wrote about seeing the first breeding uh, northern cardinal on Cape Cod uh, within her lifetime, which is pretty amazing. And uh, throughout that uh, time, uh, over the years, cardinals have just sort of monumentally increased. Um, it's easy to attribute this to one thing or two things, but there are probably a whole bunch of things that are playing into what's going on with cardinals increasing so rapidly. Um, let's throw some ideas out there. What are some ideas? What might be helping the cardinal? Yeah? Well, I was just going to ask, can we really be excited about this, or is it just a rain shift? So it's not just a rain shift. So that's a great question. A lot of times when we talk about declines, we talk about uh, movements, uh, particularly in relation to uh, climate change. Um, we think of sort of birds range if, if this is like North America. It's, this is more like North America. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if you think of North America, you know, and, and this bird's range is sort of in this latitudinal uh, area. Uh, if we think, oh, it's shifting with climate change, then everything's going to shift. But in reality, what happens is birds are really adaptable in most cases, or in a lot of cases. And so if available habitat opens up up north, they might shift up like that. But this southern range isn't necessarily going to shift. And that seems to be what's happening with cardinals. Um, so the overall population of cardinals is going up. Bird feeders? Yeah, it's a good one. So bird feeders, super important. I think that combined with, uh, in general, we'll get back to this, but in general, milder winters. Uh, we always talk about global warming, and then someone's like, oh, it snowed outside. So global warming's not real. Uh, our, one of our climate scientists at Manomet called it global weirding. I'm not sure they created that phrase, but I like it. I took it. Um, and I think that's really more like it. Uh, things are just getting super crazy and really unpredictable. And for animals that typically adjust really slowly or are used to this change being more gradual, um, it can be pretty shocking for them. See that in a bit. But yeah, so for our cardinals, uh, milder winters, we've got, uh, if it's a really harsh winter, they can always go to a bird feeder if they need to. Um, what else? What else do birds need to, to, to make a living? Well, they need habitat, and they're very well adapted to living around people. Exactly. Yep. So cardinals, very popular or very common backyard bird. Uh, they're going to be breeding in a lot of things like invasive shrubs and whatnot that are in people's backyards. Um, so as invasive species like multiflora rose, um, bush honeysuckle, and the like, um, privet, those types of things, those are also favored uh, nesting habitats and nesting substrates for cardinals. Um, so as we spread our suburban sprawl, we're helping cardinals. So I guess maybe it's not a real question. question. Yeah, yeah. What happened in 2009? In 2009? Uh, so great question. Uh, my guess is probably a really bad winter, um, but not necessarily. Uh, we cardinals are interesting too in that our fall numbers for cardinals tend to be much higher than our uh, uh, spring numbers, and it's not just because they're young ones; it's because they tend to disperse. Along um, so when we're typically looking at the number of cars we catch it's fall, that's why, uh, for instance, uh, 2020 here, we actually sadly did not ban in the spring of 2020. Um, and so our number in 2020 here, uh, th these are fall numbers. I don't know. This, I think it got squished. This should say fall. But hey, it's <coughs> it does. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. So this is inflated because uh, we didn't we didn't uh, ban all the ones in the spring that were around, so we had some extra ones. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that uh, increases like like this might be driven by climate change as well, because a similar species, and I should have thrown this on here, uh, is the Carolina wren, um, and they have a very uh, very similar uh, graph like this. The Carolina wrens can't capitalize on feeders the way that cardinals might come to sue it for a while, 
but they really rely upon being able to find insect food around. And if it's uh, a winter with a ton of snow cover, or if it's extremely cold, uh, we actually see the numbers die off pretty significantly. And it takes a year or two, but then they bounce right back. Um, so yeah, I, yeah. I, I've got a graph somewhere else, I gotta find it, but um, uh, if we can catch up, I can send that to you about Karen or Ryan's book. Um, yeah, harsh winters probably do it. But also there's just a lot of variation. So this is why we do things for a long time. Um, because if we look at things just one year to the next, there might be something out there that's really messing with things. We want to be looking at it as much as we can. Okay, so that's looking at the numbers of birds, and so we've kind of been seemingly on track with all the other bird biologists looking at declines in bird populations. Um, the other thing is looking at how perhaps warmer spring temperatures or maybe a changing climate is going to be affecting or how it affects the arrival times of birds. So since we've been consistently catching birds the same way, the same dates, um, we can actually look at sort of the average arrival times of certain species. So we don't necessarily think of blue jays as being a migrant, but sometimes 20 to 40 percent of the blue jays around uh, every single winter or every single fall actually um, so we looked at the migrant blue jays that are moving through um, in the spring, and uh, we basically can see that over time, if we look at it on a decadal uh, uh, basis, uh, they're arriving back, you know, a week, maybe even a little bit more than that, uh, early on average, uh, which a week in the spring is a pretty significant amount of time. Um, and if we think about this for, uh, if we we're looking for, we we're thinking about the long distance and short distance, and, and the air, the time that they have to travel, and the distance they have to travel, um, this can kind of impact these things. So we've got three species here. It's the red-eyed vireo, uh, and its overwintering range is almost entirely in South America. This blue here. But we've got a Baltimore Oriole. We can think of as sort of a medium-distance migrant. Uh, which overwinters in northern South America, the Caribbean, uh, and Central America. And we've got the eastern tohi, which overwinters entirely within uh, the southeastern United States. Um, and if we think about their sort of late winter, springtime experience, uh, eastern tohi is going to probably be pretty aware of an individual tohi, might be fairly aware of weather patterns that are happening. Over the, over the breeding range of that species. Same might happen for individuals of Baltimore Orioles. You know, we see these overwintering birds in the southeastern U.S., so they might be able to uh, come back on some earlier, maybe even warmer years. Red-eyed vireo has no clue. Uh, some may even wonder how they know to come back when they come back. Uh, chances are there's some sort of internal clock mechanism because why won't daylight work for a red-eyed vireo that's overwintering in Brazil? It's on the equator. It's on the equator, right? That's crazy. Um, so it's probably got an internal clock that was set maybe on the breeding grounds or maybe during migration. Um, so that's so that's something that I would think evolutionarily is maybe less plastic or less able to adapt um, than something along the lines of what might be seen in a or a choke. So we can look at um, arrival times of these species. And again, I don't know, they got cut out or something. I used to have pictures of the species next to them. For reference, of course. Um, but we've got, uh, so in, not surprisingly, these are arrival dates. And we can see that the shortest distance migrant arrives, always arrives earlier than the other ones, right? That makes sense, because it's coming back uh, from a shorter distance. Um, and the, essentially, the only bird that's really coming back significantly earlier over this course of time um, is our eastern tohi. But we can see how much variation there is year to year. Kind of surprising, but maybe not so much. Um, there's far less variation year to year in the red-eyed vireo here. Um, and that's probably because of their sort of internal clock mechanism and kind of the physical limitations, maybe, um, of them being able to arrive back in the same. Hey, Evan, 
Yeah. Um, you chose a median spring arrival days on a previous chart, and here you chose the mean. Will you talk about uh, which is preferable? <laughs> I don't have a preference. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it's essentially, so this was uh, a choice made by these guys here. Okay. For those of you who may know Trevor, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, good question. Um, so you may notice as well, though, that this was done 20 years ago. Um, and if we actually plot these out further, it just gets really confusing in a while because. Uh, if you looked at the number of red-eyed vireos you catch year after year, that number is going down. Same thing with the number of toeys, same thing with the number of Baltimore orioles. And so as the, number, as the sample size goes down, uh, the amount of variation year after year also goes up. And so uh, if, if, if I plotted out the next 20 years on here, uh, they all be even more variable than this, which is kind of wild. But if we sort of average them, see that there is no real discernible huge pattern between these guys, just on a very superficial level. Um, but our token sort of maintains its sort of early arrival time. Who knows, maybe it's even plateauing in some things, but there's some sort of uh, limitation to its ability to come back. Yeah? I was wondering, if you're banding, and then that's the purpose of your center, do you also observe, you know, ones that you don't band? Is there somebody doing that, collecting data? So, like when they arrive? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so that's a good question. Uh, on site, not consistently, no. Um, we have uh, bird surveys that we do on the property um, about once a week. Um, but it's not as uh, intensive as putting out the nets. Does it go into the charts? Does it go into the charts? It does not, no. So these are purely game. So again, like, why does it matter whether something's coming back earlier or whether something seems to be able to come back earlier or whether other ones might not? Um, this alludes to this idea of ecological mismatch. Um, so if we think about uh, food that's available for these birds, so in, in the springtime, uh, pretend you can't see this, what are the majority of neotropical migratory birds eating when they come back? Yeah, so you can say bugs, but let's be more specific. <laughs> <What's it not? laughs> well, maybe, yeah, okay. Oh, well, okay, uh, what is, uh, if you go for a walk in the woods around here in May, and then you check your shoulder after you've been walking around, okay. yeah, so the, the, the largest, most important for many of the species we catch in Canada, uh, insect food would be caterpillar. So Lepidoptera larva, butterfly moth larva. Um, and if we think about those, those come out when leaves are extra tasty. Bye. Awesome, thanks. Um, so they come out when leaves are extra tasty, and the leaves come out primarily in response to temperatures. Um, so in a warm year, uh, well, in a, in, a, in a perfect system, uh, in a, dare I say, typical year, I don't, because those don't exist anymore. Maybe they never did, but they were more consistent, let's say, maybe. Uh, uh, you have your emergence of insects in relation to leaf out, so when leaves come out. And then you have your bird arrival time coming back and peaking around and a little bit after maybe the uh, peak of insect emergence. And then by the time these are going down, the birds are then majority of birds that we catch at Manna are actually on their way up to Oriole. So they've got another few hundred, maybe thousand miles to go before they make it. Um, so it's really important for them to maximize their stay at a stop oversight and maximize this overlap, this area here between the green and uh, I guess clear uh, humps here. Um, and in early year, it's possible that this insect food can come out well before the majority of birds have come back. Uh, and so you might actually see a dramatic reduction in this overlap here between the insect, available insect food and the bird's arrival time. And so this is something that, as Pam pointed out, has been really cagey and hard to uh, really determine how much this impacts North American birds. 
That's primarily because, like I said, most of our birds are going to go up and disappear into the boreal forest, which is you know, millions of square miles of the wilderness. And if we catch a black burning warbler and it may didn't get as much food as it should have, there's no way that we can tell whether that black burning warbler is going to be successful breeding or not. Um, but there have been studies in Europe primarily on cavity nesting uh, high fly catchers is one that's cited a lot. Uh, they're adorable. Imagine like a black and white Phoebe that nests in a box. It's every bird is trained. Um, and uh, because they nest in a box, and because they uh, nest in boxes in Great Britain, there are lots of people who have spare time and uh, the uh, interest to monitor how well their uh, fly catchers are doing year after year. And they found that in years when they do not come back, uh, in, uh, when they come back late in response to, or late in relation to um, insect food emergences, uh, that their breeding success is negatively impacted by that pretty significantly. Um, uh, these fly catchers are pretty cool because they go to sub-Saharan Africa, so they've got their own sort of subset of, of things that they've got to worry about. Another thing that can happen in really warm years, this is the last thing I got here, is uh, things like this. So this is actually, what bird is this? Oriole. Yeah, it's a Baltimore Oriole. Does anyone know the, the plant species it's sitting in? Red maple. It's a red maple. Now, when do red maples usually bloom around here? April? Yeah, and these are in bud, all right? February. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. So this is a, this is a Baltimore Oriole that is on the leading edge of the spring migration of this species. Uh, this photo was taken about 15 miles from here uh, in Massachusetts uh, in uh, mid-March of last year. And this bird arrived with two other individuals as well. Um, so these were a migratory sort of a, a group. Oftentimes these birds migrate together. Should also mention, birds like this migrate at night, so they use stars. That's why light pollution is really not so great. Um, so they use stars to navigate. This bird came back and was greeted with uh, winter time, which normally you think, well, maybe there's something wrong with this bird. But my guess is that a few hundred miles south, leaf out was actually pretty far advanced. Um, so it got the wrong signal from where it was at that, oh, all systems go, let's keep going. And it went another few hundred miles north and was greeted with the frozen wasteland. Um, and oftentimes in early spring, uh, you'll encounter birds like this at people's bird feeders. Uh, things like Baltimore Orioles and Orchards and things like that. Um, so I'll leave us with this, um, which is kind of echoing what we were talking about. If you're interested in, in learning more about what you can do for birds, I strongly suggest visiting 3billionbirds.org, uh, where they go through a bunch of actionable items that uh, people and businesses can do uh, to help out migratory birds. And so hopefully you may uh, turn these frowns into <laughs> smiling faces. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's uh, time for questions and food. Try to put that habitat back, um, but 
Yeah, it's, I guess it's made with chicken and egg. But I think most people are in agreement that habitat loss is really the, you know, the real big players in, in the corners. Yeah. What were your oldest documented cat birds? Common yellow. All right, common yellow throat might be nubby toes. Remember nubby toes? Eight. Yeah, nubby toes was eight. And nubby toes is interesting because uh, he had got frostbitten or something, so he's missing some of his uh, loss. Um, and nubby toes actually bred on our property. Um, so that's a migratory bird that we caught uh, year after year. Um, and he would come back and breed on our property. And we're probably catching his babies now. But he was eight. Uh, oldest cat bird for us, I think, is around eight or nine. Yeah, we've had a, a hairy woodpecker that I think was 11, um, which is a non-migratory species. Um, but for a migratory species, that cat bird's probably up in the top for us. Yeah. So you, you show, you've got 15 plus years of data here, and you're showing the decline in numbers. You're showing the change in arrival dates. Do you have any data on the actual, for example, average weight of a toby in 50 years. Are the, bird, are the birds getting less robust? Yeah, so that's a tough one too, because oftentimes we'll catch birds when they're sort of halfway between their stopover. So, Manomet is what we consider sort of a stopover site. Think of it like a gas station for birds. Um, oftentimes we'll spend uh, upwards of a week at a stopover site. A lot of these birds might be able to fill up if there's enough food in a couple days take off. They're building up fat underneath the skin. They use that as like jet fuel. Um, they're super uh, efficient at burning that fat. Um, so they basically use up all their fat and their flight more. Um, but uh, yeah, because they're building up subcutaneous fat, we can sometimes catch a bird that maybe weighs five, maybe 10% more than another bird of its species on the same day. Um, and that's not necessarily best analog for, for their health. So we have to look at a series of other things. About but, I, but I'm saying over a period of 50 years, and thousands of birds, hundreds of thousands of birds, you see trends in, so, in what you measure. So yeah, the most interesting one is uh, something that's been mirrored by several other, so um, uh, yeah, several other long-term banding stations in the US you know, or in North America, which is that birds are getting slightly longer wings. Um, and that's something that uh, initially another banding station thought their birds were getting smaller, but then they looked at the numbers when everybody else said their birds were getting bigger. Their, their birds were getting bigger too. Um, but yeah, in some cases, things like um, uh, American robins, for instance, are sometimes maybe 8% larger than the wings are 8% larger. Um, it's consistent across uh, non-migratory species, neotropical migrants, every sort of place, there's, there's at least one to most of the species are, are getting slightly larger. Yeah. So what kind of rare species have you caught in 50 years of banding? Uh, we catch weird things fairly, well, not fairly often, but the weirdest one I've seen in the nest was a European goldfinch um, that was uh, from a race that's found in uh, the Middle East. So it was someone's pet. The coolest thing was, it was caught along our coastal bluff in a net with five goldfinches. And it had subcutaneous fat buildup. So it was like migrating with goldfinches. <laughs> it also had one wing that was five millimeters shorter than the other. Very strange. Uh, but yeah, man, that's caught like the, uh, the, hand, the first and then a handful of other records of like Bell's Murio, things like that. Um, you put, I mean, the property itself has over 300 species seen there, but it's really more an artifact of having birders on a property for 50 years with nest nets on it. Um, I feel like if you put that in anyone's backyard, that must be pretty impressive. Yeah. Any thoughts on uh, current property baby? Yeah. So I've actually reached out to the state and asked them. Couple questions because, um, yeah, I'm particularly curious about it. Most of the resources out there, the question was about uh, avian flu because um, there have been uh, several outbreaks among uh, 
waterfowl, and seabirds. Um, and most of the resources out there and the, the memos to bird managers have been saying, well, it's been very rare in, in songbirds and not really reported in songbirds, so you don't have much to worry about. But it's because the number of people banning songbirds is much lower than the number of people hunting ducks and the number of people walking along the beaches and finding dead things. Uh, so I would, I would like to actually see more uh, testing Do you think DNA samples for people that might want to do speciation type studies use sample there? Yeah, so we've over the years had a lot of different um, uh, collaborators. Uh, we've done uh, some really interesting work with uh, carbon isotopes on uh, black hole warblers that migrate through our station. Uh, black hole warbler is a really fascinating bird that um, has these massive uh, uh, fall flights. And they basically double their body weight and fat on our property in the fall before taking off nonstop out over the Atlantic and landing sometimes as far as Venezuela. Um, so they're flying 80 hours nonstop, uh, fueled just by the fat that they have on them. Um, and we found that the birds that we catch in the fall are very different, are from a different population than the birds we catch in the spring. Um, so the ones that migrate through our site in the spring are headed to Newfoundland. Whereas the birds we catch in the fall come from uh, central Alaska. Mm -hmm. So they've probably done a similar flight all the way across the board of the forest before coming to us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there are lots of interesting things you can do with birds in the hand. Um, we're pretty careful about the types of things we do because we don't necessarily want to be, um, you know, great power comes great responsibility, right? Um, so we, we tend to do uh, less invasive um, techniques on, on larger numbers. Yeah. Um, I know the Powder Mill Observatory is doing tests on, on uh, bird safe glass. Mm -hmm. Is that something you've ever done or considered doing? Yeah, so they've got a pretty cool setup. It's like a, imagine like a, a trailer that's just a tube with glass on the end of it, and then they just release birds into it, and they film the way the birds react to the glass. There's a net in front, so the birds don't actually fly into the glass. They're not monsters. <laughs> um, but, they, um, but yeah, so they've tried out a whole bunch of different things, and they've basically been able to make suggestions, particularly to developers, as to what the best um, bird-safe glass is. Um, we don't do that research at Manomet, but love what they're doing there. And, um, some of the findings that they've had have made some pretty positive impacts in like, bird-safe design for large-scale projects. If you're looking for things for your own windows, you can try those wires that the panel's showing. Um, and then there's also uh, some a product called Feather Friendly. There are these little dot applicates. It's mostly just breaking up the surface of the glass because it's a reflection thing. Um, so if you put things on the inside of your window and wonder why it's not working, it's because the reflection's on the outside of the window. So you gotta put whatever it is on the outside of the window to break that up. Yeah? I'm just wondering how long Yeah, good question. So for a great capper, if we wander around and get a great capper out of um, you know, net 50 and then bring it back, uh, it would probably take in the fall a bander maybe a minute to two minutes once it's out of the bag to put a band on it, uh, collect all those measurements, get it into the computer and it. Um, some of the birds that are uh, larger birds or birds that have more complicated Once you release a bird and it goes into 
a tree or something, that bird just acts as if nothing has happened at all. It just goes on its way. Yeah. Evan, um, I recently had an opportunity to hear a lecture by a guy who's been working on avian stress. Okay. And, and looking at stress in, in lots of different groups of birds and under various circumstances and so on. And in the course of his presentation, it was either in response to a question or something that he specifically described as far as the whole banding process. Because if you think about it, that would appear to be a highly stressful situation. But it turns out within the, the point at which a bird flies into a mist net, well, the time it's hanging in the net, the time it's, it's in the bag and goes back to the banding station, however long it's hanging in the banding station before somebody takes it out, <coughs> sticks it in a can to weigh it, processes it, measures it, puts a ring on its, on its way, etc., and it goes. Apparently, according to this guy's work, and he's, he's done this with a lot of different birds, that whole process, the most stressful point in time is the period of time that the bird is in the bag. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Fascinating. And the other, I mean, the whole presentation was right. This is a guy at Tufts. Anyway, yeah. um, the other, one of the sort of takeaways from this presentation was that many times what would appear to be to our eyes a very stressful situation to a bird or whatever, either in terms of its behavior or its vocalizations or whatever, <coughs> and what is actually highly stressful to the bird are not necessarily one and the same. In other words, the visual expression to our eyes of how a bird is responding to a circumstance might seem to be, this is very, you know, like playing a, a tape recording back to a bird that's singing or on territory. Sure. Turns out that that is not as stressful as, as one might suppose, or in some cases, and they've done a lot of, I, can, I was aware of this before this guy's presentation, but he was talking about in Antarctica where there's lots of cruise ships visiting these big, giant penguin colonies and so forth and so on. And the fact that in watching the penguins, penguins seem to be sort of oblivious to what's going on. I mean, you walk up to them, they can, they'll practically walk between your legs on their way back to their nest, this kind of thing. It turns out that when he started putting monitors on these things, and the researchers that were doing this, that in many cases, that's far more stressful, even though there's no external manifestation of stress on the part of the birds, either on their nest or just the way they're behaving and so forth, than one might suppose. So that, that this goes back to what he was describing in terms of how, how we think of stress and what we would perceive to be stressful to birds and even other animals. That isn't necessarily as stressful, but there might be other things that are highly stressful that we think, well, see, they're not, he's not paying, they're not paying any attention. You see yeah, what I'm saying? It's, it's all off so it's, it's very it's interesting, it's an interesting you, presentation. Right, you think about, uh, like, birds that are singing all day, like a red-eyed mirror or something, right. and you think, oh, that bird must be spending all the time doing it, when in reality, it's not really necessarily cost, as costly as what we think, so. Always important not to fall into traps of anthropomorphizing things. That's true, absolutely true.